Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Today we're looking at a Marantz Model 1122 DC and the customer complains of uh, problems with heavy dropouts uh, and they can kind of bang and mess with the machine and get it to come back a little bit. Let me turn the fan off for a second. So we're going to see if we can discover what's going on here. This one's in really pretty shape. Almost looks like somebody's uh, gone through it already. Uh, just too nice looking except for the layer of dust on the top of the cabinet. So I got it hooked up to a source. Let's see what it does. There's our click. And let's just flatten everything out here. So we're at, let's go to auxiliary. That's where I got it piped in on. Hertz. Something's out of phase. There we go. Yeah, you can see that if I rap on it, the channel definitely change. Just kind of messing with the front panel controls. The input selector and the tape monitor appear to be good. Up. Oh. As soon as I touch the tone defeat switch, that's when the right channel goes away. Balance control looks good. Loudness is pretty touchy. Let's cycle it again and let it go through its protection sweep. Ah, so the left channel there looks really crummy, and if we crank it up, we see that it gets a little better. That's a uh, crummy relay contact. So pretty much everything that I would expect from something this old. Oh, and everybody keeps commenting about the earwax removal kit. Uh, <laughs> I kind of keep that there as a laugh. Uh, there's really nothing in it, but I get a lot of questions from everybody. Um, so we're going to open this thing up and we're going to see what we need to clean all the pots and switches and uh, get to the relay because that's definitely what needs attention. So if you're curious, here's the inside. You can see they got a lot of open air here. I've never been fond of this design where they have these long shafts that go to these selector switches way back here. Uh, because as we turn them, sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't. see the board flex. This one doesn't flex as bad as some of the receiver versions. And if we tap on this board, we can see the channel gets crummy, although it could be the relay. Let's tap on the relay. Yep, relay disease. So relay contacts need to get resurfaced or the relay needs to get replaced. Uh, Points of interest on these is your power supply board down here. Uh, it does get a little toasty, as does the amplifier board. This person did not authorize any extensive restoration services. They just wanted it to play. But normally, under uh, regular circumstances, I would pull this board and I would repopulate the capacitors. All these capacitors are going to be baked. You can see that they sit next to these giant heat sinks, which are your driver stage, and the driver stage will cook the caps over time. Uh, but realistically, I mean, we can take a peek down in here and see if there's any resoldering that needs to be done. But usually, let's see, let's look at that guy there. Yeah. For the most part. I mean, it's not great. You got the brown glue and stuff there that really should be taken care of. Ew, call from Burbank. Uh, but these people did not, again, they didn't authorize any advanced services. I don't know why people do this. They like, they just want it fixed, but they don't want to pay any real money. So this thing will be back later on for the brown glue disease and probably a cap or two that fails.
Uh, also, this has the infamous slide pots, which love to get intermittents and open. But I'm going to take the bottom off, and we're going to see if we can get into looking at the bottom side of the power supply board, because usually the regulators need resoldering. And then we'll yank the uh, relay out. As far as getting deox in here, it's pretty easy. You can see there's an opening there on each pot. Just get an extender straw in there. Likewise with the selector switch, that's an open side. Pots and stuff like that. It's nice to make an extension straw. Because you see I can just snake it in here. And go squirty birdie. And then just work the control back and forth a bunch of times. And then as far as the uh, mode switch, it's an open frame, so you can just get in here, squirt a bunch in here, any holes that are available to you. And then just work the switch back and forth a bunch. It's helpful to have the scope because you basically just keep looking at the scope until no more artifacts appear as you turn the switch. You can see that there's no more twitchy, so that one's clean. All right. The rest of them, you kind of take the uh, bottom off, but this one actually might be one of the ones that doesn't have a service panel. Let's take a look. All right, so unfortunately, this is one of the ones... This is the early cheapo, does not have a service bottom. I must be thinking of another model that uses a similar power supply board, but you can't access the bottom side of the board on this one without pulling that board out. Fun, fun. So, in order to deal with this mess, there's a fair amount of disassembly that needs to happen in order to get this board out. I'm not thrilled about that. Looks like we're going to have to take loose this connector down here for the amplifier. That needs to come loose. And may have to cut a couple of wire ties down here for these bundles. Hopefully that's all that's required to get this up. But once we do, we can uh, do some crucial checks, maybe some resoldering and pull that relay out. So I'm going to see if I can get this apart. Okay, so pretty much like I thought, as soon as you get the uh, wire, cut, wire ties cut and uh, take the board up and disconnect that amplifier, you can get this up. And down here, there are a couple of things that need to be resoldered. We'll scrape some brown glue off of there. Check a few critical capacitors. Uh, one thing I, I definitely don't ignore is power supply issues, so... We'll get the ESR meter and check them. But more, more interesting is getting the relay out of here and taking it apart, taking a look at the contacts. Because I'm pretty sure that this relay is trash. So we'll do some resoldering here. And uh, see if I can get my ESR meter down in here and check a couple of these caps that are crucial for the regulated supply. And if nothing shows up, great. Then uh, we'll just put it back together and finish cleaning the switches and controls. If something does show up, then we have to attend to it. All right, so I got the board all soldered up. Took care of everything up here. This connector down here, that was kind of touchy. Tested all the caps. Surprisingly, they're still alive. Scraped some of the brown glue off and yanked our relay. So my assumption is, is that this relay is pretty trash. We're going to crack it open and see... And usually what I do to do, you, bleh, do to get them open is a little tiny jeweler screwdriver and just pry and pull. Interesting that this one looks like it's been uh, pried open already. Like somebody had an issue before. Anyway, this requires two hands, so let me pop it apart. All right, there she is. Contacts aren't skewed. We've got good placement of where the contact strikes the other contact. Let's take the little spring off of here. Take the contact plate out. And let's take a look at it. 
there pretty much like I thought. You can see there's some pitting there, definitely some damages. Looks pretty crusty up in there too. So what causes this? Well, a number of things can cause it, anything from amplifier failures to excessive load, but most commonly what causes it is people are lazy. They leave the volume up when they turn the machine off and when they turn it on. And the energy behind the contacts as they close creates arcing, which uh, more or less causes pitting and breakdown of the contacts. I'm sure there's more scientific explanation for it ionization of the air, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but yeah, so what I do is, is I get some 2000 grit sandpaper. And you can get this at an automotive supply store in the paint and body section. And I just very carefully uh, wipe away the garbage on the contacts. Just maybe one or two swipes. And then I'll do it the same with the other. So I'll just clean this a little bit here so you can see it. looking better already. You don't want to take a bunch of material off because then obviously you're not going to have much contact material or it's going to be uneven. So I'm just going to give this a couple more slides. It doesn't take much. And then what we'll do is reassemble this. It's a little tricky to do with one hand, but I think I can do it. There's that. And then we have to reattach the little spring. Make sure it's in the little groove. And to do the second part, as you can see, I've cut it down enough to fit in between here. And so then I'll just push the contacts to close them as I clean it up and just double check my work as I go. taking a look down in here camera won't focus but it's cleaned up enough I can see it here that it looks good if you want to go even further spritz a little bit of deox on those contacts and rub them around so let's go ahead and reassemble this thing now okie dokie so the relays back in this thing the power supply boards back in this thing now if you want to get to your selector switch <laughs> to clean them you might as well just put it on its side and then again this is where the extension straw comes in handy because you got to get to this one and you got to get to that one way down there not possible but still got to do it because it was a little touchy it wasn't bad but again no service panel on this one this must be one of the first ones where they just said screw it Kind of like the Kenwood KE3500. That one doesn't have a, a service panel either. So, again, with your extension straw. Squirt both sides of the wafer. I can get some light on here so you can see. Just going to work this one. All right, and then the other one, which is way down there. Let's see if we can get a good camera angle on this one. Probably not. Let's see. Can't really see all that well. But again, this is where the straw thing comes in handy. You can probably see the straw there just off camera. And let's see if I can snake it down here. And rotate it a bit. this 
one. that now I haven't done the slide pots yet so let's do the slide pots and it's the same kind of principle you can get down in here with your extension straw I've got a little bend in it so I can rotate it in the right direction and just get it up in there let's do the middle one Let's do this one over here, ensuring I'm every, giving everybody motion sickness right now. All right. You don't want to use a heavy amount of deox on that because it will wash out the silicon lube inside the faders, so just use a tiny little bit. As far as the balance control, you can try to get it down in there. You can see it down there at the bottom. You can also go in through the front too as long as you don't get too messy with it. Tone to feet, all the little push button switches are down here. These are a little more of a pain to do because, as you can see, when you activate them, they move those little switches back and forth, the black things down there. That's where you want to spray your contact cleaner in, not into the mechanism. You want to spray it on the side of the switch here that moves because that's where your contacts are. Assuming I can reach down in there. one over here and we've got to turn the pressure down there we go but you got to get down in there with the cleaner and then work them clean them up one over here that we can't really see because it's being obstructed. If we get down here, we can kind of see where it's at there. And we'll work this one too. I know this is really exciting. This is what you got to do to clean these things up. And then there's the loudness switch and all that other stuff down in there. So let me finish these couple and then we'll fire it back up again. On second thought, I got to show you this part because this is important. Uh, so you're, you're, you've been used to cleaning the ones like down here that are for the loudness tape and etc. But the speaker selector switches way down there. As you can see, have little holes in the top. So focus. There we go. So you need to get the cleaner down into those holes because those holes are your way to get this thing cleaned up. And it's hella hard trying to do this with one hand, but anyway, your extension straw is going to get into those holes there, and then you'll work those. So that's how you clean them. Okay, okay. Well, here it is. Let's uh, flip the switch and see if it flies or if it fries. Wait for the clicky. All right. Let's go to our scope and take a look. As we can see coming up, we get a nice clean sine wave. And if I manipulate the controls, we've got no nasty transition. And 
then if we get our tone to feed, our channels don't drop out, our tone controls are smooth, if we mess with the input selection, get a clean break from everything, filters, loudness, uh, loudness needs a little more help. Working it a little bit now. It's starting to clean up and be a little more linear. There we go. Okay, speaker selector. Yep, that's happy. Good. That's what I want to see. So this is happy and working again. Let's turn down the sensitivity a bit and then see what kind of power it puts out. We'll just run it up to clipping. There we go. Back it off a smidge. Okay, let's see what the meter says. I'm gonna grab my fluke and um, turn it just briefly here. Can't really do this holding the camera, at least not without risk to the amp. So let me run it up. Let me take a measurement. So there we go. That's what was recorded. 24 volts RMS, and that's right at the clip point there. So let's see what that uh, equivalates to in watts into 8 ohm. So what you do is you take your maximum voltage output, AC, in this case we'll round down to 24, square it, and then divide by the number of ohms. So we come out to 72 watts a channel, which is pretty decent. It's about what I'd expect from an amplifier with that kind of power supply. Now that 72 watts per channel I measured with 700 hertz. Technically you're supposed to do a thousand but it's not really going to be that much of a difference. I can just read 700 better on the scope. Uh, and that wasn't a sweep from 20 to 20,000 either but it gives you an idea as to what kind of power output your machine's going to have and make sure you've got a decent load box to do that test with. In this case this little homemade load box it's got 300 watt resistors on them with sliding taps that I've dialed in for about 8 ohms. So just a little note on power testing there, that's an, a way to do it. You can buy load boxes from places like Parts Express and stuff like that that will do up to 200 watts, I believe. Um, or you can make your own. You can go to Mauser and get those big, fat 200 watt Dale metal film resistors, which are pretty expensive. Uh, but if you have to have it, you have to have it. I just managed to scrounge those up. So anyway, uh, that's all for this video. And I hope you guys enjoyed seeing this and uh, more stuff to come soon.